This talk is about CNS vascular drainage. Thus, it will include brain and spine vascular drainage. We will start by talking about brain vascular drainage. Understanding the vascular drainage of the brain is a daunting task, mitigated by the fact that the area of drainage of a particular vascular structure can be, in most cases, figured out by either the name of the vessel or the trajectory of the vessel. So, most of the time, I will let the drawing do the talking in regard to area of drainage and will emphasize name, origin, and trajectory. In the next frame, I will show you a 3D drawing of the brain in the skull. In this drawing, you can get a perspective of the relative position of the vessels in relation to the bony structure surrounding them. Notice the left internal jugular, left external jugular, left vertebral, left facial, and left retromandibular veins. I will now go to a two-dimension drawing to list these and other components of the draining system. This is a two-dimensional representation of the brain draining system. We can make memorization easier by dividing the brain draining system into an intracranial component and an extracranial component. I will first talk to you about the extracranial brain drainage component. The extracranial brain drainage component can be further divided in two divisions. The internal jugular division. The internal jugular division is called so because the blood in this division ultimately drains by the internal jugular vein to the heart. This division collects venous blood from primary two sources from the sigmoid sinus, which goes directly into the internal jugular vein, and from the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus drains into the pterygoid plexus. From the pterygoid plexus, venous blood has three ways of reaching the internal jugular vein. One way is through a direct connection with the internal jugular vein. The second is through the pharyngeal plexus to the internal jugular vein. And the third way is through the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins going through the angular vein the facial vein, ultimately draining into the internal jugular vein. The second division of the extracranial drainage component is much less important under physiologic conditions than the previous one. This division is called the posterior brain drainage division. The posterior brain drainage division drains to the general venous circulation through two veins, the vertebral vein and the external jugular vein. Two intracranial elements drain to the posterior brain draining system division. One of them is the sigmoid sinus and the other one is the occipital sinus. The two intracranial elements that drain into the posterior division of the extracranial brain component do so into the occipital plexus and from there into the vertebral vein and the external jugular vein. The external jugular vein is at times not involved in draining the occipital plexus, 
and in those cases all the drainage from the occipital plexus takes place through the vertebral vein. Now we will talk about the intracranial brain draining system. The intracranial brain draining system is by far more complex. In this figure it is represented in bright blue. I like to start talking about the intracranial brain draining system by singling out two structures, pivotal to the conceptualization of the intracranial brain draining system. One of these structures is the transverse sinus, which you can see in this specimen indicated by the arrow. Notice its position at the edge of the tentorium. And the second pivotal structure is the sigmoid sinus. I have now enlarged these structures and isolate them in this new frame. The isolated structures are the right and left transverse and sigmoid sinuses. It is into these sinuses that the two divisions of the intracranial brain draining system, the infratentorial division and the supratentorial divisions drain. The supratentorial division has four constituents to which we will refer as systems. The first I will address is the midline superficial system. This system drains at the junction of the right and left transverse sinus. This site is called the confluence of the sinuses or the torcular herophily. The main structure of the midline superficial system is the superior sagittal sinus. The superior sagittal sinus originates at the foramen cesium with a contribution from the nasal cavity vessels. The superior sagittal sinus gets along the way from anterior to posterior many tributaries from cerebral or breaching veins. These veins drain venous blood from the brain parenchyma adjacent to the superior sagittal sinus. A tear in any of these veins are often the cause of low pressure bleeding producing subdural hematoma where blood collects between the inner dura and the superagnoid layer. This is a sagittal view of the superior sagittal sinus. Also in this view, you can see venous lacuna, emissary veins, which connect the intracranial with the scalp veins, and cerebral or breaching veins. So, the first constituent of the supratentorial draining division is the mid midline superficial system. The second constituent of the supratentorial division is the midline deep system. The midline deep system also ends at the confluence of the sinuses. I am presenting it in this frame a view of the midline superficial system to provide perspective to the introduction of the midline deep system. This system is rather complex. It is because of this complexity that I have constructed a chart to serve as a roadmap for the introduction of most relevant components of the system. The term I have used are, I think, the most commonly used 
but by no means universally used. So here we go. As we mentioned before, the midline deep system drains into the confluence of the sinuses. Here, indicated in this figure by the arrow. The confluence of the sinuses is fed by the straight sinus, indicated in this figure again by the arrow. The straight sinus receives tributaries from the superior and inferior cerebral veins. Here I have indicated the superior cerebral vein and here the inferior cerebellar vein. The state sinus is also fed by the vein of Galen, here indicated. The vein of Galen is fed by the inferior sagittal sinus, which I have indicated in this figure. And now, in this specimen, notice that the dual inner dura that forms the folk cerebri split to form the inferior sagittal sinus before forming the tentorium. This is an old drawing from Conigan's textbook of anatomy. In it, you can see a drawing with several of the intracranial structures that I have just mentioned, some of which I will point out to you again. The inferior sagittal sinus, the vein of Galen, the straight sinus, and the confluence of sinuses. Now, let's go back to the chart and name other structures feeding into the vein of Galen. These structures are the single midline posterior vein of the corpus callosum, which drains the splenium of the corpus callosum and surrounding areas, which is here indicated in this figure. The vein of Galen also receives blood from the right and left occipital veins, shown here, and also from the right and left internal cerebral veins. Here indicated is the left internal cerebral vein. The vein of Galen also collects blood from the basal vein of Rosenthal, here indicated. I now want to go back to the division chart to remind you that we have been talking about the mid-line dip system. The third system of the supratentorial division is the lateral superficial system. This system drains to the transverse sinus. The lateral superficial system, which I have now incorporated to the diagram, is anchored by the superficial middle cerebral vein. Here, the left one is being indicated. This system is complemented by anastomotic veins. The left cerebral anastomotic veins run over the cerebral hemisphere, connecting the superficial middle cerebral vein to the superior sagittal sinus. This is the same on the right. The cerebral anastomotic veins drain most of the cerebral lateral surface of the cerebral hemispheres. The anastomotic veins can be divided in two tiers. 
The vessels indicated in this frame are those of the superior tier. And in this new frame, those of the inferior tier. Among these two tiers, two veins are most important. The superior anastomotic vein of Trollard and the inferior anastomotic vein of Labé. So we have just finished talking about the third supratentorial system, the lateral superficial system, and now we will address the fourth and last supratentorial system. The fourth supratentorial system is the lateral deep system. This system drains primarily to the sigmoid sinus. I am adding to the figure we have been constructing the lateral deep system, as you can see in this frame. The pivotal structure of the lateral deep system is the cavernous sinus. The cavernous sinus connects with the basilar venous plexus running on the clivus with the superior petrosal sinus and with the inferior petrosal sinus. The cavernous sinus also interconnects anteriorly and posteriorly and also has extracranial connections which we mentioned earlier on in this talk. So now that we have finished talking about the supratentorial division, we will talk about the infratentorial division. This division drains into the sigmoid sinus and into the confluence of the sinus. I hope you are familiar with this figure it portrays all the supratentorial draining structures to which I am adding the main elements of the infratentorial division, the occipital sinus. Other structures involved in the drainage of the posterior fossa will be addressed shortly using a different figure. Before we talk about them, I like to stress that the name and location of these vessels vary much from one patient to the other, a fact that is reflected in anatomy books by the many names and locations given for these vessels. Here I have drawn a sagittal midline cut through the posterior fossa structures to show you the location of the veins and sinus draining it. Here I have listed some of the vessels we have already talked about. Please stop the video and take a few minutes to read them. In this new frame I have included the names of other vessels in this region which I have not mentioned before. They are very inconsistent in their trajectory, thus as previously mentioned they are named differently in different books. So the main purpose of showing you them to you is that you know that they exist. We now have a good general understanding of the brain, brain stem and cerebral draining systems. I will expand a little bit on the midline deep system. I am doing this because of its importance. This importance often translate in an occasional question in the USM LE1, which consists on identifying and indicating the different structures. Please take a look at this uh, frame. It has a, a typical question, as you probably will find in one of your exams. And the question here is vein of Trollar, and it gives you four choices. The answer is C.
Medical students bent on getting honors and those aiming to do neurology or neurosurgery must be able to identify the major sinuses and veins of the midline and lateral dip system in four planes shown in this frame. I will first address the transverse view. It is important to understand that the brain is a three-dimensional structure which cannot be fully represented in a two-dimensional model. Hence, structures presented in a transverse cut will correspond to more or less the right anatomical position in the horizontal plane, but not in the vertical plane. This is a brain specimen. Look from the top. The lateral view indicates the site of the cut I will show you in the next frame, which is this one. And in this new frame, I have limits its size and now enlarge it in order to superimpose the mid deep draining system of the brain. As you can see in this new frame. We will use this figure to talk about the internal cerebral vein and indicate all the vessels you need to recognize in the horizontal plane. This view allows us to see the internal cerebral vein. The internal cerebral vein drains into the vein of Galen. The internal cerebral vein receives blood from multiple tributaries, including the lateral ventricular vein. This vessel drains the white matter of the parahypocampal gyrus and part of the choroid plexus. The epithalamic vein that drains the dorsal part of the diencephalum. The veins of the third ventricle posterior and anterior choroid plexus from the septal vein. This vein drains the septum pellucidum and portion of the corpus callosum from the anterior terminal vein that drains the orbital surface of the frontal lobe, the rostral portion of the corpus callosum and portion of the cingulate gyrus from the longitudinal caudal vein from the superior thalamostriate or terminal vein and from the choroidal veins. These vessels extend into the inferior horn of the lateral ventricle. In addition to the internal cerebral vein in this horizontal view, you need to be able to identify the vein of Galen, the posterior vein of the corpus callosum, the vessel vein of Rosenthal, the internal occipital vein, the superior cerebellar vein, the inferior sagittal sinus, the straight sinus, the confluence of the sinuses, the superior sagittal sinus, and the transverse sinus. So we have looked at the midline deep system view in the transverse cut. We will look at the same system in the mid sagittal view, which I have here enlarged in this frame. Here I like to start with the vein of Galen. Vessels that drain into this vein are the internal occipital vein, the inferior sagittal sinus, the posterior vein of the corpus callosum, the superior cerebellar vein 
at times called a superior vermis vein because of its location on the roof of the vermis. The basal vein of Rosenthal, often referred to as the great basal vein of Rosenthal because of its many tributary among them, the anterior cerebral vein, the olfactory vein, the temporal vein, the inferior thalamoestriate vein, and the posterior mesencephalic vein, to name a few. This is a segment of the original article published by Rosenthal describing the vein that ended up with his name. Here you can see the right vein of Rosenthal partially obscured by the temporal lobe. On the left side, the temporal lobe has been removed in part and you can see the ramification of the vein of Rosenthal better. Stop the video and take a few seconds to look at the figure, if you wish. So we have looked at the mid sagittal cut. Now let's look at the third view, the inferior cerebral surface view. Here I will show you components of the midline and lateral deep system. In this view, you should be able to identify the vein of Galen, straight sinus, the confluence of the sinuses, the transverse sinus, the sigmoid sinus, the superior petrosal sinus, the inferior petrosal sinus, the cavernous sinus, the cerebral arteries, the basal vein of Rosenthal draining, the midbrain, temporal lobes including the upper surface of the temporal lobe by a tributary called the deep middle cerebral vein and the lower surface of the frontal lobe by way of the olfactory vein, as we have mentioned before. It is also important to identify the cavernous sinus, the superficial middle cerebral vein here indicated, and here, the sphenoparietal sinus, the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins, and the central vein of the retina. So we have looked at the inferior cerebral view. Now I like for us to look at the posterior fossa draining system from above, which mainly coincides with the lateral deep system as you can see in this frame. This is another view of the cavernous sinus and posterior fossa venous circulation from above. Now I am indicating the location of the pituitary stalk, the clivus, and the foramen magnum. Here we must be able to identify the cavernous sinus, the carotid artery traveling through the cavernous sinus, the anterior intercavernous sinus, the posterior intercavernous sinus, the sphenoparietal sinus draining into the cavernous sinus, the central vein of the retina, the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins, the structures found posterior 
to the cavernous sinus are also important to recognize. Please make sure that you identify the vascular plexus, which communicates with the marginal sinus around the foramen magnum, the superior and inferior petrosal sinuses. Laterally, the cavernous sinus communicates with the pterygoid plexus, from where the middle meningeal vein originates. So now we have looked at all the intended views. I know that this has been a long talk and you're tired, but one more thing before I let you go, and that is the drainage of the spinal cord. The drainage of the spinal cord is rather simple. Key to understanding the spinal cord drainage is the relation between the dura and the neighboring structures. The dura of the spine, unlike in the skull, is not attached to the periosteal dura. Here, just call the vertebral periosteum. So the epidural space is real. In it, we find the internal vertebral venous system, this plexus has the form of a ring outside the dura in the epidural space. It is called internal because it is inside the vertebral canal. Inside the dura and hugging the spinal cord, six vessels anchor the inner ring of the vessels, the anterior and posterior median veins indicated here and the four anterolateral and posterolateral veins. The epidural ring and the spinal cord ring drain by the anterior and posterior radicular veins to the segmental veins and from there to the general circulation. Thank you very much for your attention.